welcome everybody, and it's wonderful to have you back. Uh, there's been a long, prolonged absence where many of you could not get into the country, and we were doing things by Zoom and the like, and Baruch Hashem, although we're not out of uh, the, the COVID completely, this kind of a third or fourth wave, but Baruch Hashem, we're able to be together. And uh, we're very, very grateful. As uh, I've said, as the Rosh Hashiva has said, uh, you are really our collaborators in the work that our Sameach does. So uh, we're really very honored, very happy, and very excited to have you join us again. And now that I see the breakfast that Ursameich is capable of producing, you know, <laughs> we're going to see if this could be a permanent feature for the, for the, Bachram, uh, for the Bachram as well. Who knows? Uh, anyway, uh, I'm always a little uneasy. Uh, for some reason, I've, I've fallen into this Q&A mode where that seems to be my dominant uh, type of share these days. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, always a little uneasy being in the position of the answer person because there's a lot that I obviously don't know. And many of you, Baruch Hashem, have your own Rabbanim and your own poskim and, and connected to Gedolim. So uh, there's nothing that I can really say that I'm some type of authority here, but this is kind of my job. This is what I do. So I'm doing it as a job and I'm doing it because I think uh, some of the mentors requested it. But I do so with a, a great deal of, um, I won't even call it humility. It's just a great deal of truthful recognition uh, that there's a tremendous amount that I may not necessarily know. So my standard line always is, that uh, you are free to ask me anything you want, and I am free to tell you I don't know the answer uh, to the particular question that you're asking. I also, also want to add, just as a little aside, that uh, uh, many of you know that the Rosh Hashiva Rav Nata is, is recovering from a surgical procedure, and uh, I, I'm not sure if he will be able to interact with, with the mentors during this mission or not, but all of us should be mispalo, that the Rosh Hashiva should have a Rufu Shlema and come back and rejoin us uh, very, very soon in good and vigorous, vigorous health. So the floor is, is open, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Yeah. So <clears throat> being from uh, Los Angeles, and I'll call it one of America's unfortunate liberal uh, cancer society, and I'm being kind in my words. <laughs> uh, so that we, we and, um, unfortunately, we you know the discussion of uh, of people who are uh, just scrape over of uh, you know unfortunately in homosexuality and and the uh, the alphabet soup that people are putting out in the uh, in the atmosphere that is uh, prominent with uh, with with uh, all kinds of craziness. Now, what is uh, what is what is the rough? Uh, the, what is the rough thing and the Jewish perspective as in terms of Chas uh, the acceptance or shunning it totally or are we supposed to in any way if such a Chas such a thing occurs and we come across it how are we supposed to handle if such an occurrence occurs in our circles since you know I am a business man and uh, you know, living in Los Angeles or being anywhere in New York, I know I imagine Canada or anywhere, even I've seen uh, pride flags, this craziness here, here in, in, in your shot. So what is the Jewish perspective and what does the rabbi particularly think about? Yeah, I just want to say, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, the gay rights movement is one of the most absolutely successful public relations campaigns in the history of the world. Uh, it is unbelievable the way uh, the values of the average, at least American, has changed really in 10 or 15 years. Listen, there were always homosexuals. If the Torah answers it, uh, obviously it existed. But there used to be a sense what you did privately is what you did privately is between you and God. And, you know, I, I'm not interested, even as a rabbi, to kind of go into people's houses and, you know, uh, arrest them or, or whatever it is. You know, good, people do have averses between them and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But what has happened in the past... I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, is that it's not even enough to be tolerant. It's not even enough to say it's none of my business. I have to be machsher. I have to give a hechsher. I have to give a legitimation. I have to say it's a good thing. And if I can't say it's a good thing with Sheva Brachas and Chuppah Chasvit Rachman Olitzlan, and this is actually true, then I'm a bigot. Then I'm a homophobe. And that's mamish, you know, there's a Gemara in Chulin and a Medrash Rabbah that talks about the Dor HaMabal. The Dor HaMabal was Necharav when they started writing a kasuva for Mishkav Zohar. That's a very important Gemara. 
Huh? That's a, it's, a, it's actually a medrash. The Gemara says it, but it's more beferish in the medrash. Now, note what it says. It doesn't say the Dor HaMabal was destroyed because of Mishkav Zohar. Mishkav Zohar is an Avera. It is an Avera. But at least when people know it's wrong, all right, it's an Avera. But the real Avla is when you redefine sin and deviance as mitzvah. That our Kaddish Baruch Hu cannot be cycle, and that's exactly the situation uh, that, that we are in. I am aware of at least one Orthodox rabbi, and probably not a lot, Baruch Hashem, who was fired from his job because he refused to let the shul make a kiddish in honor of a same-sex wedding. And they said, you know, who are you to, who are you to judge? Do they want to celebrate a, a simcha? You know, and he, he lost the job. He lost the job because, yeah, well, well, yes, it was obviously modern. It wasn't, it wasn't in Lakewood. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> yeah. you know, it was modern Orthodox. But, but within the modern Orthodox community, there is a gradual movement because, in a sense, from a personal standpoint, I understand it. If Rachman Litzlan, God forbid, uh, one has a child who has an SSA, a same-sex attraction, so you want to love him, right? You know, et cetera. So I understand from a human perspective, you know, you want to do everything you can. But Lamaisa, there are boundaries. There are gavulim. So my advice, which is not that helpful necessarily, and it's very general, is on one hand, I have rachamim, because it is a struggle. I'm not going to dismiss. I'm not going to look at a person who's struggling with this and saying, you're a Russia, you're a Garnish, you're a bad person. It is a struggle. And I have Rachmanis for a person, uh, and I want to help them in any way that I can, but I cannot legitimate. I cannot, you know, go to the wedding. I can't celebrate something that the Torah calls a, a Tayeva. So it's a very difficult line to, to draw. I mean, I wouldn't say, for example, if I'm dealing with a supplier who happens to be gay, I can't do, I wouldn't say I can't do business with him because he's gay. All right, I mean, uh, this is his private thing. All of us have to give a din b'cheshben to the Rebani Shalaylam. But if he invites me to a, you know, a, a gay wedding or uh, whatever it would be, uh, I, can't, I can't do it. Uh, and certainly uh, you can't celebrate it in a show. Uh, you can't make a kiddush, go, go to a kiddush for it. So you have to make, make a gavol, that's all. And I, I, I would just say that tolerance moves in both directions. If I'm a chuyiv to be tolerant of what they're doing, then somebody ought to be tolerant about my value system as well. Meaning I'm not imposing, I'm not forcing people to keep the Torah, why are they forcing me to betray the Torah? I mean, well, you want there to be tolerance? Let there be tolerance. Let, let, it, let it move in both, in both directions. I mean, I, I've had situations, and again, it's, it's, it, it is tragic, of, uh, from families even in Yerushalayim who have uh, sons or daughters that are going that way, and the parents are understanding. No, they're, they, they listen to the child, they don't say anything, and the child is angry at the parent. Why aren't you more supportive? What do they expect? The parent is not even criticizing the child. The parent saying, hmm, I hear, I hear, I hear, I hear. Child says, not enough. You have to validate my choice. And that already is the medrash, that when you start writing a kasuva for Mishkav Zohar, uh, there's a real problem. Now, I just want to point out another thing, that society has changed. You know, it, it used to be, the estimate used to be that around 2% of the population had homosexual leanings. Now, somehow, it's gotten up to 20% of the population. How do you get a tenfold increase? The truth of the matter is, there is something that is actually called cultural homosexuality, meaning to say, yeah, I could go either way, but if society, but I want to make a statement that this is mutter and this is good and this is kosher, so people are becoming gay by choice to some, to some degree, to some degree. And uh, the same, by the way, the same thing is true with transgender. I, I don't want to get into that. Uh, but there are just a lot of high school girls in particular who are just saying, hey, you know, it might be nice to be a man. Uh, why, why not? And it's literally a cultural choice that people are making, which is aided and abetted by the psychiatric community, which is really a shand and a cherpa. This is going to eventually be a tremendous, tremendous scandal in the psychiatric community where they're actually encouraging, pushing uh, transgenderism. So we live in a world of tremendous chayshech, tremendous confusion. I mean, I, I can go on, I can digress my inyan li inyan. Um, intermarriage, let me give you another example. Intermarriage has been around a long time. But it used to be understood that if my uncle was married to a shiksa and I was making a bar mitzvah, I was making a wedding, the non-Jewish woman had the 
understanding that she doesn't show up at a Jewish event. I mean, it was a derech garet. It was a basic menschlich type of idea. Today, that's not the way it is. You got to be machshir me. You got to accept me. I got to be part. It's in your face. And that is already the erbuvia of redefining chayshech to be or and or to be chayshech. And that is much worse than the underlying Avera itself. The Avera is an Avera. This makes it much, much worse. So I, I appreciate the difficulty you're grappling with, but no, you no, got I'm not dealing yeah. with it. No, but, so my response, my response is that there's no way, there's, there's no, absolutely no room of acceptance. No, I, I understand, but, 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 you, but you understand the ambiguity, meaning there's no room to accept this as a way of life. Yes. But the person himself, I mean, if God forbid a person has a, a child that is gay, I mean, do you sit shiva for the child? Do you act as if the child is dead? Do you cut off any connection to the child? Or do you still, you know, want to have a connection? Remember, even if a person marries a shiksa, they can still put on tefillin and learn. Even if a person is gay, they can still keep Shabbos. Meaning, right. the mitzvahs are valuable even if it's in a context of other decisions Averis. of Averis. So we do have an achrayas to try to encourage a connection to Judaism in whatever way is shayach. That, that's all I'm saying. And to have a total rejection can sometimes turn into uh, losing them entirely. But then you're right. The danger is you wind up accepting the lifestyle, which is no good either. So, so you have to have this very delicate uh, balance. I guess what you're alluding at is that even if you're, you know, the, the idea of shtika kavda, that even if you're quiet and you're, you're sort of like, uh, accepting the situation, are you not sort of like buying in to the idea that we're accepting of this kind of lifestyle? And I think that's what you're struggling with. If this, yeah. if I'm, as an example, I mean, we don't have an issue. I know, I know the. No, yeah, I know yeah the, I'm not talking about your family. Generally, generally we're talking about yeah. the, the, the rub of the Vigila here in, in Arsamea. Yeah. So I don't know that there's a formal membership uh, of the, the shul. Here. No, no dues except but, tuition. But in, in, in North America, as you know, we we have structures in, in shul where we have membership. So what what would happen? You know, if you're the rub of a shul and you're confronted with um, a couple like this, they say, "Listen, we want to join the shul." So uh, what, what 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 do you? I, I think it's very very clear that on one hand, as individuals, I would let them join, assuming I, Mechal Le Shabbos can join an Orthodox show, Mr. Mrs. but not absolutely not Mr. and Mrs. That is yeah. putting an official stamp of approval from a base Knesset right, and right. from a Rav that they are recognized as a couple. So I'm going to tell them you you can either have separate memberships or right. or or nothing. That's the only choice that that's available. 100 percent correct. Now that does have a risk. They may just decide you know who needs you. But, you know, you can't really compromise uh, something as basic as this. And I want to put out that in the modern Orthodox community, this is beginning to be a real crisis. There are more and more same-sex marriages. And uh, I understand if you interview for a rabbinic position in a modern Orthodox synagogue, you will be asked, one of the main questions that people ask is, would you uh, go to an important member's uh, same-sex marriage of children? And, you know, it can go either way in that. I don't know which way you're supposed to answer, but the fact that they're asking the question <laughs> indicates that this is a live issue, uh, tragically. Yeah. When I think about the way the yeshiva system was set up 100 years ago, it was set up for the elite to become, it's like law school, so to speak. You go to become a rabbi, you study Talmud all the time. And today, it's a completely different world where instead of having a small section of society, it's a whole system set up like that. So my question is, what do you think about the way that the yeshiva system is set up today? And maybe shouldn't we make it much broader, more hashkafa, more halakha, more midrashim, things like this? And second part of the question, which is connected is, in terms of the ideal Torah observant person today, it's, there's a lot of pressure to say, okay, you know, you have to wear the black suit, white shirt, you have to go in this place, and die. You, you can't really be yourself, the, the ideal person, is kind of the person who sits and learns and sitting, there, rather than being accepting of each person's individuality, specifically when we tell the kids, 
al pidarko and meet your potential and all these things. And then when they actually go practically to observe, well, you should dress this way, act this way, and go to this place. Yeah, these are really, really excellent points, and you're really touching buttons that I often talk <laughs> about, and I could talk about this for five hours, uh, and I can get in trouble <laughs> with it as well. Uh, but, you know, you know, you know yeah, maybe, maybe so. Uh, but but bo both of your points are absolutely correct. You have to understand that the yeshiva movement, as uh, Rav Chaim Belazhener and later in the glory days of the Nitziv and then Slobodka and Mir, really was dealing with a very elitist group. Um, in fact, there are many, many more Talmidim and yeshivas today than were at the height. Belazhen at its height never had more than uh, 400 Talmidim. Mir you know, has more than 7,000 Talmidim. Lakewood has, has more than that. Um, and uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky once said that the yeshiva derech of very deep analytical lumdas was a response to the challenge of Haskala because Haskala basically attracted the best and the brightest by showing them the brilliance of science and philosophy and the literature. So there needed to be uh, an attempt to show them, you know, Chas Rishon to even say it this way, that Torah can be just as good. I mean, of course, I mean, obviously. In other words, you know, you think, you think physics is deep? I'll show you Rav Chaim or Baruch Bear. But unfortunately, that's not so much of the challenge today. We are in a much less intellectual generation. You know, if you would ask uh, somebody 100 years ago why a Jew shouldn't go to university, they would say something like, well, he'll get exposed to Spinoza and Kant. And, you know, says, oh, today, almost halvai, you know, the guy would read Spinoza. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is drugs and sex and, and, and have chaos. So, and of course, uh, our goal in the Frum community is to make yeshivas as open and as accessible as possible, to bring everybody in. So the question is, it's like you're offering a PhD in nuclear physics uh, to every single student who comes in, even though they're not on that particular level. Now, Rev Dessler, the great Rev Dessler, who is truly a phenomenally great person, in fact, besides Mr. Milio, if you just know about his life, what he did for Harbatsas Torah in England and in Eretz Yisrael was absolutely amazing. He made a statement that is really one of the most controversial statements I think he ever made or almost anybody ever made. He quoted the Gemara that says, Elef uh, a Lemikra, a thousand students come in to learn Chumash, uh, and only one is going to be the Hira, going to be the Posek. So Rav Destri looked at this in sense of a war. He said, you know, in a war there are going to be casualties in order to achieve a victory. So we got to create a yeshiva system that will produce the Godol Hador. Even if that means there'll be a lot of people who are not as well served. He doesn't mean they'll die mamish, Baruch Hashem. Most people who go through yeshiva benefit tremendously, but they don't benefit as much as they might by an alternative curriculum. But the fear is in that alternative curriculum, you might be losing out the chazenishes and uh, whatever, the people who could have become the gedola hedor. So this is a very, very difficult shikol that I think uh, anyone who runs a yeshiva uh, has to think about very, very, very carefully. Besides the political issues of switching a yeshiva curriculum, which in Heritage Israel particularly would create a lot of uh, political fallout, but let, let's put that aside. Let's just say that I'm trying to create the ideal curriculum uh, for people. For many, many people, it wouldn't be such a heavy, heavy emphasis on uh, in-depth learning of Gemara. Might be more of a Bikiya Sterech, Gemara Rashi Tosvos, more Halacha, more Chumash, certainly more Hashkafa, and uh, more uh, attention to Ikre Yamuna, which is a, a real, real Chisarin uh, that we have and uh, less emphasis on the kind of the yeshivasha, yeshivasha derech. Now, of course, here in Or Sameach, we are a little different because we, we, we do precisely address many, many areas because we have uh, people who are coming in with more limited backgrounds. But uh, even in Or Sameach, you know, we're, we're very heavily uh, into Gemara, and if you're dealing with a standard Haredi yeshiva. Now, Ger, interestingly enough, a few years ago, made this revolutionary decision to switch to uh, Bikias. Uh, they, they, they kind of were a the uh, whole Limud Be'in, which is you know, pretty, pretty astounding. But whatever it is, uh, part of it was because some of the middle class, middle of the road Bachrim were not benefiting from that high level. So it's something to, something to think about. You know, uh, in my old yeshiva near Israel, so many of you have probably heard of Rabbi Socher Franz. He's a very uh, popular, very charismatic speaker, an old chavrusa of mine. 
Uh, so he has, within the yeshiva system, he has a separate shear that is geared to more halacha lemaisa dika topics. So if the yeshiva is doing babakama, he'll be doing arve psachim. Here in Orsameach, for many, many years, we had Rav Moshe Pindrish, Ishlita, he's, he's uh, still here, but he's uh, retired from teaching right now, uh, who taught a shir in the base medrash along the same lines, in which instead of the yeshiva shemasechtos, he was doing brachos and beitza and, 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 and arve psachim. So at least that's a partial recognition that people are served in different drachim. And I think there's more to do, but the question becomes, should I create a curriculum that serves the many? or a curriculum that'll produce the Gadol Hadar. And uh, is it possible to keep both around? And that's a real, real challenge. Rev Dessler felt that the sacrifices were worth it, but on the other hand, uh, ask yourself, are you willing to, put your to sacrifice your child for the cause? <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, or maybe your child will be one of the Gadol Hadar, but, but if not, like, you know, uh, is my child being, being well served? Now, your second point is equally valid. And again, I can talk about this for five hours. And that is Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest of all people, taught us Chanoch Lenar Al Pi Darko, uh, and the Vilna Gaon explains, that, and this is the sub symbol shot of the Pasuk, everybody has a unique derech, uh, and yet uh, there's no question that in the yeshiva world, there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, centrifugal force, so to speak, not just the yeshiva, the Haredi world generally, uh, the Frum world, you know, whatever, uh, towards a certain conformity. Uh, we look at people who are dressed a little different as strange people, not quite, not quite making it. Now, I understand that as a sociological phenomenon. You want to create a community. You want to create cohesiveness. That, that, that does make a lot of sense. You know, we want to, just like gangs, you know, you wear, the, you wear the uniform, right? If you don't wear the uniform, you know, you're not part of the team. That does serve a, a community building function, which within Jewish communities has a certain resonance. But I think we over-exaggerate it. Uh, they, they say with the Satmar Rav, that somebody, uh, although the Satmar Rav was against Aguda, against, you know, against, against almost everything, uh, but he personally had a friendship with Rav Moshe Scherer, the head of Aguda, even though Satmar Rav did not hold of Aguda. So somebody asked the Satmar Rav a different point, how could you befriend Rav Moshe Scherer? He doesn't even have a beard. So he said, I would rather be friends with a Yid that doesn't have a beard than a beard that doesn't have a Yid. Uh, <laughs> meaning that we sometimes over-exaggerate chitzainius, externalities, without looking at the panemius. And the panemius is what is ultimately important. Chitzainius can express panemius, but it's not the same as panemius. So all I can say is, you know, you're preaching to the choir, meaning to say, uh, I agree with everything uh, that you've said, uh, and it's something that I think uh, thoughtful people, thoughtful mechanchim, do think about. But as I say, uh, there are problems on both sides of the equation, meaning to simply overhaul the yeshiva curriculum and turn it into uh, like a seminary. Some people say, you know, girls want to learn Gemara, right? So they say, so sometimes girls agitate to make the Beis Yaakovs or the seminaries more like yeshivas. The truth is, maybe we should make the yeshivas more like the seminaries. I mean, you have a seminary, a girl can get a very well-rounded, depending on the seminary, education. Uh, Tanakh and Hashkafa and history and everything else. Uh, in yeshiva we have Gemara, not, almost, almost nothing else. But on the other hand, if you do turn uh, yeshivas into the seminaries model, uh, you'll produce, I think, uh, maybe a stronger cadre of solid, orthodox balabatim. You may lose out on the highest level, Talmudei Chachamim. And that's going to be a little bit of a, um, a concern. Uh, I've mentioned a number of times, many of you might know, either know or know of Rav Aaron Lapiansky, uh, the Rosh Hashiv in Silver Spring, one of the, actually one of the great uh, Torah thinkers in America. And he wrote an absolutely excellent book on a very, very important topic, Ben Torah for Life, which is how does a working person continue to grow in Avodah Sashem? Because one of the downsides of the idea that we stress in our Lit Yeshivas, that the only real significant life you can have is a life that's totally devoted to learning and everything else is second class. So the problem is, what happens if I find myself in that working environment? And then we sometimes have the attitude, hey, what's the, what's the purpose? You know, I mean, uh, whatever I do is, is not choshuv. So he, he, he has a book that is really 
making the case in the other direction, that there's a way of being an Eved Hashem in every single matzah of your life. And I will say, if I can, if permit me to say it, that I think in some ways that is one of uh, the main things that you mentors contribute to our program because most of you, maybe all of you, do come from a working world. Second and uh, in a sense, no, 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 but, but, you, but you understand, you're actually sending a very important message because here someone comes to yeshiva, the Haredi world of Yerushalayim, and the only role models they look up to are people who are learning full time. And they know that for many of them, that's not going to be the life they're going to pursue. So they don't have a clear picture of how they can remain B'nai Torah in a working environment. And they're going to be relegated to second class status or whatever it would be. So Baruch Hashem, uh, one of the things that you uh, people can show our Bachrim and show our Talmidim is the commitment to Torah learning and the commitment to Avodah Hashem within a framework of working. And that's an extremely important lesson for our Bachrim to, to absorb. So that's yet another reason why we're kind of grateful uh, that, that you are joining us. Okay, one quick question yeah. um, See, so your, your, your questions make me talk a long time, but okay. <laughs> yeah. I love Rob I love, I love Desley. He's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. The, the only pushback I would say to what he said, yeah. he li lived at a time, he made a statement after the World War, where Torah was destroyed. And he felt we needed to rebuild it at the time. And we had maybe Panovich, we had Mir, things like this. We don't have what we have today. So if Rav Dessler were here, I would say, with, you know, why can't we have those people being yep. created out of Lakewood or Mir, and at, we can broaden out the yeshiva system yep. for a lot of our brothers and sisters who don't have any access to anything. And yep. for them, let's start them off with that. Yeah, uh, you, you are actually very correct on this. Uh, Rav Dessler, after the Holocaust, uh, was almost like a man possessed. If you see his letters, they were at a, a fever pitch about there is nothing that's more important than the rebuilding of Torah full time. We've lost so much. It is a, a, an emergency that everybody has to be conscripted. And even the Chazanish, who is really the father of, more or less, I could say the father of the Haredi educational system in Eretz Israel. I mean, Chazanish, we don't realize the influence he has in Eretz Israel to, to this very day. He set the boundaries. He said that we need full, a full two generations or 70 years, they're two girsos, of full-time Torah learning. Now, people forget to check, but the 70 years are up. And, and, and as a result, the question becomes whether we need to think about new modalities. Now, even Rav Shach, who was the, the Gadol Hador, began to talk about the need for Parnassah Institutes. Not, not universities, he wasn't, he wasn't going that far, but Parnassah Institutes in the Haredi community. Rav Steinman mentioned it as well. Now, it's, what's interesting is that the uh, Kanoim start disparaging even the Gedolim. Rav Steinman talked about Parnassah Institute shortly after his trip to America. So I actually saw somebody said, says, oh, you see how corrupting America is. Even, even Rav Aaron Leib, you know, comes to America. He comes back talking about money and Parnas. <laughs> but I can assure you that Rav Steinman was not affected by America. This was a sheet that he helped. So what's going on is uh, there is a real tension going on, I think, in Eretz Israel now today. Number one, parents themselves are tired of the intergenerational poverty. It's getting harder and harder and harder. We're running out of rich fathers-in-law. You know, we had rich father now like nobody, you know, by second, third, fourth generation, like there's nobody rich you can marry into uh, at, this, uh, at this point. And uh, uh, anglo Olim are also changing the equation a little bit because anglo Olim are not, are not quite comfortable with, uh, with this type of system. So I predict, and I'm no expert, I, I predict that in the coming years, there are going to be changes. Now, yesh dorshin l'shvach, yesh dorshin l'shvach. Some people say those changes are awful. Okay. Some say they're, they're long uh, overdue. But I, I think we're, we're, we're seeing changes in the, in the system that are beginning to come out. So I can just ask, right? When, yeah. when your Rabbi Huda Anasi wrote down the Mishnah, just as an example, I imagine there were people who were not happy with that because <laughs> they're door in the door. Everybody's, what are you doing? You're what writing you down doing? a Torah Shabbat. You're doing a Shabbat. Well, hey, did we talk for us to perspective? You know, you're you're right. Every, 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 cha every change is going to create so controversy. The, but on the other hand, question to this is, we're not Rabbeinu Akkadosh. <laughs> right. How do we, how does, 
how does that happen? You know, like it's, it's nice that we want, I mean, the rut zone is important, but... Well, well, well you know, we have to work with, with guidance of Gedolim. It's not simply... Yeah. Not, now, many ideas may start bottom, bottom up, meaning to say parents are concerned. I, I mean, I understand because they're in the field. They have the kids. But, but ultimately, we then go to our Gedolim. Uh, we talk. Uh, they, they become aware of the problem, and then they help us formulate responses. Now, granted, gedolim, uh, gedolim themselves have machloksim, yesh v'yesh, uh, but whatever it is, but you, you follow the gedolim that you follow, and hopefully uh, they will guide us into a good place. You know, but, uh, but as I say, that doesn't mean you as a parent uh, should keep your mouth shut, meaning you should have access, you or your representatives or your rabbanim should have access to the gedolim to make them aware of the issue. You know, uh, I don't want maybe to, maybe it's not a respectful expression, but in computer programming, there's an expression garbage in, garbage out, meaning to say, even the greatest gedolim, if they're not given information that is accurate, will not necessarily be able to guide us. So there needs to be uh, a, a way in which we can present things to them. That's been a problem in Eretz Yisrael Lemaisa, because Baruch Hashem, we've been blessed with Gedalim who were zochet to great, great Arichus Yamim. But what happens is, when there's great, great Arichus Yamim, we kind of limit who gets to see them and when they get to see them and the like. That, that frankly, and I'm being very honest, that can sometimes create problems in, 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 in the, the Gadol having access to the correct Metzias. So that's part of an issue. But, but assuming that we can create access uh, we have to follow the G'daylam. The G'daylam give us the hadracha, how to navigate these difficult issues. Question? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, boys have been involved with over here at our 25 and 26, and yeah. they're starting their journey, or they're in the middle of their journey, and they took them at Shaduchim. What do you recommend, what's the guidance for them? Because nobody's a finished product. Right. They who are traveling, you know, they're looking around, and that girl's less than their level, mid-level, how do you advise yeah, yeah, so the, the, it is a difficult issue because obviously uh, even if someone is 26, they may not yet have the foundations to be able to establish a home. On the other hand, uh, they're old enough and uh, they're impatient and, and they feel they need to get, to get married. Uh, so first of all, the one thing I look at much more than even a uh, level of relig religiosity and knowledge is emotional stability. That, that's extremely important, meaning to say the person has to have a vision of where they want to go in life. Now, maybe they're not there yet, but they have a hasaga that this is the type of person I want to be, this is the type of home I want to be, I want to have, and this is the direction I want to go. If they're not sure of their own identity, then they're not ready to get married. I, even though it's, I understand it's hard to tell a 26-year-old that he's not ready, but frankly, they won't be ready. And when this happens sometimes, I'm aware of divorces very early in a marriage. You know, so it's really catastrophic generally to marry without a sense of who you are. Uh, in terms of above them, below them, uh, it, it, it really depends. I mean, I, I think the short answer was to find somebody who's kind of like you, meaning uh, the closer they are. Now, I know that many Bali Chuva have a dream that they would like to marry an FFB. They would like to marry a from from birth because that way they have a family, you know, et cetera. And, I, and that can work, Baruch Hashem, uh, it works sometimes. But generally speaking, although we like to say opposites attract, generally speaking, yeah, men and women are different, and of course they are different, and that's, that's good. But the closer you are kind of in background and value system, the easier it is to have a relationship. And since marriage is so stressful today, and living in Israel is very stressful as well, uh, I think you try to eliminate as many extra stresses as you can. So I would kind of encourage a Balchuba to marry somebody that's kind of on their level, but committed, but committed to growing and committed to moving and, into a higher level. Um, anything else has its risks. That doesn't mean it can't work out. Baruch Hashem, it certainly can work out, but it's risky. So I think we try to be risk averse when it comes to marriage. That's certainly to during marriage. your journey where it's like in flux and uh, they really don't know. Um, I, I, I don't even recommend them getting married uh, because they're not ready yet. They don't know who they are. What if they get married, God forbid, and they decide six months later they don't want to be from anymore, right? What's going to happen then? Uh, and it happened. I mean, I'm not, Baruch Hashem, it doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. So if you don't know who you are, you're not ready to have a relationship of marriage with somebody. And just as a follow-up, as a parent of children, when 
do we say that a Bell Chubak is at the level where they should be as far as like accepting them in and knowing that they're statements? Well, uh, number one, a lot of this will be uh, your own personal observation. I mean, you know, we, we can generally see how stable somebody is. And number two, it's very, very important that you check references, uh, Rebbeim, and, and uh, try to find people who are honest and open. I mean, sometimes uh, in the shidduch process, there is either maybe not misrepresentation, although that you have too, but at least cover-ups. Yes. So I know myself, I, I, I very much try. I try very hard uh, to be honest, but in a positive vein, if, if you know what I mean. Meaning to say, I, I do, when I'm contacted, I do point out the drawbacks, but I always try to counterbalance it with at least a description of the positive features, so they should, you know, so, so they could at least evaluate it in an overall context. But it's very, very important. When it comes to shiduchim, there is no room for lying and no room for misrepresentation. It's mamish and avera. Uh, people say, "Oh, I can't talk about this because it's lashon hara." That is an obvious mistake. There's a chi of the arais. In fact, that's our sugya. Lo samar al dam reyecha, not to stand by idly, uh, to let somebody get conned into a relationship that is not good. Because I didn't want to say lashon hara about the chasan. Let's say, from my perspective, I'm over pashit on lo samar al dam reyecha. So you have to be honest. You have to be open. But you can paint the picture, taking into account the positives as well as the negatives. But yeah, yeah. You mentioned before about uh, a Jewish guy who marries a shiksa, still is high in the mitzvahs. How would you recommend? I happen to have a nephew, unfortunately, have a, that married a shiksa. He says he has the Jewish itch. I'm concerned on one hand, you know, his derek, so to speak, would say, oh, simple conversion, my child's Jewish, that wouldn't be correct, and be living this lie. And yet, at the other hand, he's always been warm to Judaism, but never really took it holistically. Well, how would I encourage him or you know, away from this or tell uh, the truth about that? Or well, I assume if he, you know, if he's in your family, he knows you know, your position on intermarriage. He probably knows that already. So you don't necessarily have to give him drushos on things he already knows. Again, I would be encouraging. I, you know, I would offer to learn with him or set him up with partners in Torah or some type of chavrusa system. Encourage him to make kiddush, even with his non-Jewish wife. And by the way, let me point out, uh, with the Paiskim or David Hoffman, uh, Melamed Lahayo uh, already ruled that although we obviously don't encourage people to convert in the case of an intermarriage, we are allowed to be proactive. Now, this doesn't mean fake conversions, but it means you're allowed to bring the non-Jewish partner in in the Jewish things that you're doing to give her an interest in Judaism and mitzvahs so that in a base, best case scenario, which there's no promises, she might actually want to embrace uh, Yiddishkeit and have a gear kahalacha. We don't do that with a stamgoy. We, no, we don't, we're not proselytizers. But in this type of situation, it actually is mutter. So once it's done, you could be makar of them as a family, family unit. So basically, you, know, you don't legitimate, you don't say mazel tov, you don't, say, you don't go to the wedding. But when you're presented with that existing situation, it is better to be makar of. You know, Rebecca Kamenetsky pointed out that in Europe, the minog was that when a child, uh, in fact, even in Shalom Aleichem, so if it was on the roof, you know, when the child uh, intermarried, you sat shiva, the child was dead. He said, Bisman hazeh, that is not the appropriate response. Because in a from society like the shtetls were, if you were intermarried, you were basically spitting on Judaism. And you were saying, I want nothing to do with it. Today, intermarriage is, Rahman al Islam is so common that, you know, you're not necessarily rejecting Judaism. You say, oh, you know, what's the difference who I marry? So in such a situation, Rav Yaakov says it is very important to maintain a kesher with the person. So you can invite them for Shabbos. Inviting for Yom Tif is more of a shayla because inviting a guy for Yom Tif is a halacha kesher. Okay. Uh, uh, certainly uh, to set up your, 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 your nephew in some type of learning program. Again, Partners in Torah, is, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. It's a very, very excellent model. And, uh, you know, don't talk about the things that will not make a difference right now. Because if you talk about, hey, intermarriage is bad, 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 he's going to just drop you like a hot potato, and that's going to be the end. Now, what can sometimes happen is, as I say, the best scenario is she herself gets passionately involved in Judaism. And uh, a second scenario is, as he grows in his Torah, he'll realize on his own that intermarriage is wrong and make the decisions he has to make. 
but he has to come there from, from the Torah that he learned and from the mitzvahs that he's done. At the, at the level that he is right now, for you to attack the intermarriage would just drive him away. Like nobody's going to say, oh, my un- I don't keep Shabbos, I don't keep kosher, but my uncle told me intermarriage is wrong, so I have to leave. It's, it's just not going to happen. Because from his perspective, there's nothing wrong in what he's doing. But as he grows in Yiddishkeit, he may come to a certain hakara and make the decisions that he has to make. But, so it has to come through that process. Rabbi, can I ask a follow-up on that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah, just on that yeah, just case. Yeah. If someone is dating someone not Jewish within your family, and they had a bad experience in Jewish school, so it's, more, it's very difficult because on the one hand, they kind of know more about Judaism, but they had a bad experience. But at the same time, the more you try to try to encourage them not to be with this person, they're more likely to rebel anyway. Yeah. So how do you handle so, that? So, yeah, well, these are very, very hard situations. And I, I do want to point out they exist even in Orthodox, the Orthodox world, mainly modern Orthodox, but not, not exclusively in the modern Orthodox world. What I would try to do, and it depends if you can do it, is I would say, listen, marriage is a big decision. Dating is a big, you know, dating for marriage is a very, very big issue. And even things that you think are not important now might become very important later. So I tell you what, I would like to send you to Israel to a JLE or to a three-week program before you make any decisions. Just learn about what it is that you're turning your back on. That's all I ask. I'm not asking you to break up. I'm not asking you not to go through with this. I just want you to learn about Judaism before you make your decision. Now, again, no promises, but we've had, Baruch Hashem, many experiences or many situations where even a few weeks in a learning environment in Eretz Yisrael in particular has been very, very life transforming and people make new decisions. And I, that's what I would try to push. And it's not always possible, but that would be the way to do it. I'm sorry, did you want to add something? I, I did have a question. So yeah. um, it, it slowed us down a little bit on the, uh, the learning plan for yesterday, but the guy I'm working with is a little older than the average mentee, and he's yeah. a teacher, and he calls himself agnostic about religion, generally speaking. Yeah. You could prove it to me. I'll put, and he is married, yeah. To uh, a non-Jewish woman. Uh, he did not confess that. Okay, so no, 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 no. I strongly suspected. Uh, I'm sorry. This, this, this is a this is a student or a mentor. I assume it's not a, a mentor. Yeah. And, okay. And so um, <laughs> yeah. we were talking about we got kind of bogged down, and I was a little bit caught on a, on a prepared. He said, "Okay, so I accept the uh, and and he's somewhat familiar with Yiddishkeit, so he says, okay, so I accept that uh, there's there's one God." He said, "If I'm born a uh, a Muslim in Bangladesh, then I know that that is the true faith. And if I had been born a fundamentalist Christian in Georgia, then I would know that is the true faith. So what makes this truer than all the other true faiths?" And we had a discussion about true for him. And, and, and that's kind of what we are commanded to do and that sort of thing, but I'm not sure I handled it as well uh, as it could. Well, you know, I think you did, you did as good as you could because, because that's, a, that's a real, real powerful question in many ways. And that is uh, people tend to gravitate to the environment that they were raised in. Uh, if I was raised a Christian, I would have that belief. I will, if I would be raised a Muslim, I'd have that belief. So I'm Jewish. But I will tell you this, you know, uh, let me quote from the Dalai Lama of all people. You know, the Dalai Lama has a lot of Jewish followers, unfortunately. In fact, nine out of ten converts to Bud- English-speaking converts to Buddhism are Jews. Wow. Which is, on some ways, it's Rahman al-Islan. On the other hand, uh, it means people are seeking spirituality. Searching They're searching, which is actually good in some ways. So when a Jewish person goes to the Dalai Lama and says, I want to become a Buddhist, the Dalai Lama says... Yeah. I'll take you, but you first have to explore where you were put into. Because he actually said religiously, if God puts you into a certain environment, then initially he wants you to explore that environment. Now, that actually means, there's actually a svara, so to speak, that if God puts you in the Jewish people, that is where your soul needs to be. Now, uh, Judaism doesn't say everybody has to be Jewish. For example, Islam is not idolatry, and according to uh, Rabbeinu Tam, even Christianity is not idolatry for, for Goyim. So in a sense, Judaism acknowledges the existence of multiple pathways to God that have a certain legitimacy, if they're non-idolatrous and the like. But if you're born 
as a Jew, then God is basically giving you a message that your identity has to be defined uh, by Judaism. Now, this is regalachas. I mean, obviously, when you get into proofs and arguments, I mean, Judaism has a very, very rational foundation. In fact, uh, one thing that uh, this gentleman might consider is that since both Christianity and Islam are offshoots of Judaism, that's absolutely clear, meaning a Christian believes there was Maimon Harsinai, a Christian believes there was Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, but they simply say God changed his mind and kind of superseded everything. Well, I think they would have the burden of proof on that. If they're moda, that everything in the Torah was emes, but somehow it got changed, no. That's Hamotzi Michavero Ola Faraya at that point. So this is not an answer to the atheist, but I think it is an answer to the one that's saying, why is Judaism better than Christianity and Islam? The answer, well, one answer is because both Christianity and Islam acknowledge that Judaism was the true religion and they claim it was changed. So the evidence of that change is, happens to be very weak, which is an interesting point. Rabbi Gottlieb makes this point that most of the world, I'm not sure about the numbers because the Chinese, but most of the world believes Hashem gave the Torah at Harsina <laughs> because that includes uh, at least religious Jews, religious Christians, religious Muslims. They all believe in Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and Maimet Harsina. So it's a fascinating point. Okay. Oh, yeah. You mentioned in your introduction about we're, we're having missed each other because of COVID. Yeah. How did the yeshiva yourself, in fact, in discussing with the Bukhari issue, deal with this worldwide phenomenon. God shook the world. And yes. now that he's shaking the world, are we any better for it? Yeah, so that... We become more, <laughs> more exacerbated, more impatient, and more, more violent, actually. And all the things that came out of COVID, it doesn't seem to, that the shake had any benefit to it. You know, uh, Albert Einstein once said, uh, there are two things that are infinite, uh, infinite, uh, one is uh, the universe, and the other is human stupidity. And he says, and he's not sure about the universe. <laughs> so, uh, human stupidity, he said, is the only one that is guaranteed to be infinite. And, you know, you're right. Uh, COVID itself, I think in, in our yeshiva, and I'm sure other yeshivas had similar experiences, was a very difficult time. But I think it was a time in which people actually grew. We, you know, we learned to learn Torah and to teach Torah in sacrifice, in difficulty, in uh, the people who worked hard to create the environments and the safety measures and everything that had to be done. The chesed that Bachram showed, other Bachram who needed food brought to them. Uh, so those who were able to be here during that difficult time. I think grew a lot. Uh, and Baruch Hashem, we were able to keep our learning going almost on 100% level, some of it remote, some of it uh, in, in person, in and of itself. Um, so, it, like, like, like is often the case, this adversity was a very, very positive experience. And in terms of Musser, the Musser we took from it is that we think we're in control of our environment. We think we have all of these systems in place. Hashem can make everything fall apart. And in a sense, obliteration of ego is a necessary condition for Mashiach. The Maral says, this is why the Geula is called Tzmicha. Tzmicha is the growing of a plant. Because just as when a plant grows, the seed has to disintegrate, so too we have to get rid of our egotism before there can be Geula. That's a very important point. COVID, I think, taught us that we're not masters of our fate as we think we are. The problem is that we forget these lessons so quickly. It's, it's, it's so amazing. We all had this feeling during the experience. Now, Baruch Hashem, Hashem put us through a difficult experience. Now, uh, although you know, there are plenty of other difficulties in the world, but at least this particular difficulty has gotten much, much easier to deal with. So it's back to life as normal. And you'd wonder, how is that possible? You know, a year ago, we would not have thought life will go back to normal. People talked about the new normal, the permanent adjustments in life. And yet, we go back to our hergel. And uh, that's something we need to think about. We need, that's why Hashem gave us memory. Hashem, we have to remember. Remember what happened. Zuchor yimos olam, the Torah says. Look at history. Look at the background. Look at your experiences. Learn from them. Integrate them into your life. So, yeah. 
uh, we do have to take Musa from all that uh, was happening because God forbid if we don't, uh, well, as Santayana said, those who don't learn from history are condemned to relive it and uh, we have the same idea. If, Baruch, if we don't take the lessons of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then chas v'shalom, we sometimes have to relive and re-experience those lessons. So I hope that all of us would, will take the great Musa that we need to take from the COVID experience. Okay, well, thanks so much. It was good, uh, good talking to you. Okay. Right, don't stop forgetting.